Hey guys, Sun here. I'm a privacy and security researcher and you're watching The Privacy Guides. This is episode eight of the Bitcoin series. And yes, I did publish this for a short period of time. I wasn't happy with the episode, so I decided to uh, reshoot it. And I also made a very bad typo when I was uh, <clears throat> sending a warm shout out to ShakePay. Uh, so yeah, I decided to do it again. So in today's episode, we're gonna be talking about multi-sig and why multi-sig is a really essential piece of technology in the context of Bitcoin, especially for people who have larger holdings. It's something that can really help uh, all of us sleep at night. Um, now, this uh, episode is clearly for people who are holding larger amounts of Bitcoin in the context of me with the donations. I don't hold a lot of Bitcoin, uh, but I kind of set up things in a very secure way so that I would kind of case study it before I would share this with you. Uh, now, before we go ahead and jump into today's episode, as always, everything you read down there in the comments, that might be someone trying to steal your crypto or steal your money. Uh, please be mindful about this. Uh, I'm also counting on each and every one of you to report spammy comments. Uh, I've been reporting a shit ton of them. A lot of people are trying to exploit this content, which makes me very sad. But nonetheless, uh, thanks for helping out. Um, I also want to send a warm shout out to ShakePay. ShakePay has supported the privacy guides as a whole and has sponsored this whole Bitcoin series. Without ShakePay, this series would have never been created. It's a huge amount of work to do this. So thanks ShakePay. ShakePay is a Canadian Bitcoin exchange used by Canadians to buy and sell Bitcoin. So yeah, thanks. Um, all right. So in today's episode, I will show you guys how to set up a multi-sig wallet on Electrum. We're gonna use Electrum to store one of the private keys on our Mac. Uh, and we are going to use two Trezor ones uh, to set up the multi-sig. So multi-sig uh, is essentially a security scheme or a governance scheme in the context of Bitcoin that allows uh, a wallet to be created with three keys. It can be created with, you know, I don't know what the limit is actually, but it can, I've seen five of sevens, I've seen three of, uh, two of threes. Uh, you can also have a two of two. So it's essentially a way of setting up governance systems around Bitcoin, where in order to sign a transaction that will be broadcasted to the blockchain, one needs to have X of Y signers. Uh, so in today's episode, we're setting up a two of three. That means that you need your Mac, but you also need one of those uh, Trezor ones. The cool thing with this is uh, you get to choose where those Trezor ones are stored. Uh, hopefully not at the same location as you have the computer. Um, that means that there is no single point of attack if someone goes to your home and steals both your computer um, and well actually steals your computer and that not much they can do there. If someone is trying to exploit your computer uh, with a keylogger, for instance, uh, they cannot do anything uh, except for you know seeing your balance which is a problem um, but nonetheless they cannot you know steal the holding so the way i usually see people do things is uh, you have one of those that is at a remote location unknown and perhaps one of those is in a safety deposit box at the bank what i really like of the safety deposit box at a bank uh, scenario is in order to sign transactions uh, one has to go to the bank and a bank is really a safe place so if ever one is threatened uh, we are in a safe location where we can kind of disclose that we are under attack. Uh, now, hopefully these kind of um, threat models don't apply to you. I mean, I find it very unfortunate that some humans have to worry about this kind of stuff. But nonetheless, it means that, you know, the funds are safe. And if your house catches fire or anything, if you have good backups, and I'll be talking about backups. Uh, actually, I'll talk, about, I'll talk about backups right away. Uh, in the context of this setup, one of the keys is on the Mac, so you really have to be mindful about backing up the Electrum wallet file. Um, I have a whole episode dedicated to using Veracrypt and rsync to create encrypted backups. I'll link to it in the description. That is what I personally use. Uh, so I essentially end up having a copy of the Electrum wallet encrypted on a USB thumb drive that is waterproof. I like the Samsung bars and that is on my keychain. So if ever uh, I'm out of the house, I usually have my keys. That means if ever the you know, my house catches fire and I lose my computer or if my computer is stolen, I'm fine. So you do need to keep a copy of those keys. Uh, I tend to not have paper backups for those keys because they're in the computer and they're actually quite si uh, quite simple to back them up. And given private keys don't change over time, um, another model that I really like is using little um, SD cards. This is a SanDisk. Those SD cards are also waterproof. So you can have those at other locations and that makes it like really redundant. Now, when it comes to the Trezors, um, 
for instance, like this is a Model 1. Um, I have encrypted paper backups. Now, hopefully this will focus. Last time it didn't. Um, so this here is a paper backup. And you may notice here what is written. So it's written like 35E3, blah, blah, blah. So that is a cryptographic uh, signature of the encrypted payload. And the first uh, eight digits are also uh, usually labeled on the Trezor device. Um, when I say usually labeled, I mean, I usually do this. The uh, important thing here is, is this is a pair and that pair I usually back up a backup store in a vault or store at a remote location. So if ever the Trezor was to break, uh, I have the paper backup alongside it. So that is a really robust system. So again, multi-sig two of three, it allows us uh, holders to um, safeguard you know, Bitcoin holdings and make the setup very redundant uh, against you know, fires, attacks, and it's a great way to mitigate both InfoSec, uh, so like computer level threat models, and OPSEC, physical uh, threat models. Uh, so yeah, multi-sig is great. Now, it is also great in the context of governance. So perhaps you have a company with a few founders and you wanna make sure that one founder can just run away with the Bitcoin if you have some Bitcoin on your balance sheet, for instance. So a really cool thing in multi-sig is uh, it can also be used so that each founder has uh, you know, a wallet like this and accounting may have access to the holding, but they cannot transact. Uh, so usually in this scenario, someone would have a hot wallet with smaller, you know, amounts and a cold wallet, which is the one that would use multi-sig. So for larger transactions, founders would need to be involved. Um, so with all that said, let's, uh, let's jump in. Um, so I published an episode a while back called how to install and use Electrum over Tor on Mac OS. I would recommend following that episode in order to set up Electrum over Tor. It's a much more private way of doing things. And I also published an episode on how to manage Trezor devices using Trezor CTL on Mac OS and or Tails. Uh, Trezor has a really cool command line utility that is used to provision Trezor devices. And that is what I use to pre-provision two of those for today's episode. So they're already configured, private keys are stored on them. I also created paper backups. So uh, yeah, please be mindful of this. They are already uh, configured and I would recommend doing the same if ever you're following today's episode. So, uh, without further ado, if I go down here uh, in the usage guide, I can run this command line to start. Whoa, not sure what this said. Looks like paste bracketing was left, blah, blah, blah. Whatever that means. Hmm, interesting. Sorry about that. Um, so, copy pasting this here, enter. That will start the Tor SOX5 proxy that Electrum will connect over. If I pop open another win uh, <coughs> tab here, I can then run this and add the testnet uh, command line argument. So I will be showing you guys all of this over testnet so that your real Bitcoin is not moving around. Um, okay, so, but exactly the same applies without testnet, by the way. So you're covered there. So we created a wallet last time uh, and uh, I'll open it actually. Okay. So, uh, and I also uh, sent a little bit of Bitcoin to it, uh, or actually testnet Bitcoin, so that we get to transact. So this is one wallet. Now, if I pop open another, um, oh, interesting. Um, yeah, so uh, we'll call this one um, multi-sig, multi-sig. Okay, next. Um, so when you wanna create a multi-sig wallet, um, yeah, you need to make sure that you have hardware wallets. You can also, uh, by the way, create a multi-sig wallet using multiple Electrum instances. I used to do this back in the day, uh, setting up or using Electrum on Tails and then using that as a signing entity. But from a UX perspective, it's kind of shitty. So um, yeah, multi-sig uh, wallet, next. Now we want to have, whoa, sorry about that, three co-signers and we need two signatures. That means that both the Electrum setup and one of the two Trezor devices in the context of today's episode is required to sign and broadcast a transaction. Um, next. So uh, signer one of three, we're gonna create a seed in the context of Electrum for this. Uh, so next. And now, as I mentioned, I believe in the episode on how to set up Electrum, uh, one should always extend the seed with custom words. And I need to write this down on a piece of paper here. So give me a moment. 
Okay, so I have this here. Next up, uh, we are going to enter the um, seed extension or whatever it's worded. This is tend to be called, I think it's called a passphrase in the context of Trezor and here it's called like a seed extension. Um, so you may notice that I am using uh, the same uh, passphrase here that I used in the Electrum episode. So I'm using this in the context of, you know, setting up Electrum as you guys see this on camera. Um, I guess it's debatable if one should use this both as the seed extension and the encryption key. Uh, seed extensions, I like to use those in the context of creating multiple wallets from the same seed. That is especially valuable in the context of Trezor devices. As I mentioned uh, earlier in this series, Trezor devices uh, have a weakness where uh, it is possible through a sophisticated attack to extract keys from them. That is why one should always use um, a passphrase in the context of Trezor devices. Now, uh, depending on your threat model, you may want to have different passphrases for each device or for the encryption of Electrum, that is really up to you. It's definitely safer to use different ones, but please be mindful that one needs to remember those. And it is actually probably, depending on the threat model, more risky to use multiple ones and then forget them or store them on paper uh, than to use the same one and make sure that that one's in your mind and is part of a system so that if ever you die, it's passed on to your loved ones, stuff like this. So I'm using the same one in the context of today's episode. Uh, now I need to confirm the seed. All right, then this again. Okay, so uh, we now have a master public key. So each uh, wallet, including Electrum and the Trezor devices, uh, will have its own master pub keys uh, and, own, uh, and all those master pub keys will be kind of merged together to create uh, a multi-sig master pub key that will be used uh, to generate, you know, receiving address and stuff like this. That's why Electrum is capable of generating addresses, but in order to sign transactions, uh, one needs at least two of three signers. That means that we need access to two of three private keys. Um, okay, moving on. Now uh, we wanna co-sign with a hardware device. Uh, so for this, uh, I'm plugging in one of my Trezors here. Once this here is plugged in, I hit next uh, and I will have to enter the pin here. So, okay. Uh, so now I am in the device here. Oh, actually pin invalid. Damn it, sorry about this. Okay, now I need to enter a passphrase. Again, Trezor devices, one absolutely needs to use passphrases. I talked about this on in pretty much all the episodes where I mentioned Trezor. Uh, so I will enter this here. Uh, and once you entered it on the actual device, uh, it says access hidden wallet. Next screen will show the passphrase confirm. Uh, one has to be really mindful that this passphrase is used in the key derivation process, meaning that uh, that device, uh, that passphrase will be tied to this specific wallet forever. So we cannot change that passphrase. I guess the word passphrase may be misleading in this regard. It's actually an extension. I think Electrum kind of uses a wording that is more logical for most people. So. Um, yeah, that cannot be changed later. It is part of how the Trezor generates the private and public key. Um, so confirming that this is good, make sure you don't have a typo there, and then we're good. Now the uh, script type and derivation path, I might create an episode later on this. Uh, the default there is perfectly fine. Um, so next, now we wanna co-sign with another hardware wallet. So I'm switching over to my other Trezor here. Uh, whoops, okay. Next, next. So I configured both with the same pin. Again, that might not be the best for you if you have a really, you know, or actually, I mean, depending on your trip model, it might not be the best, but also in the context of multiple, um, like founders in the context of a company with Bitcoin on the balance sheet, I guess each founder would wanna choose their own pin uh, for obvious reasons. Um, okay, so. Okay, so again, typing the passphrase. Okay, perfect. So again, confirming on the Trezor here, uh, is this the right passphrase? Yes, it is, confirm. Okay, so uh, now next, and we need to set a password. This is the encryption password for the wallet on the computer. Boom, okay, perfect. So it is asking us to insert Trezor, blah, blah, blah. I don't have enough USB ports on this setup to have both Trezor simultaneously, but we only need one to be able to sign transactions. So no, it's perfectly fine. 
Um, now, next up, uh, I will be sending over some uh, testnet BTC from this wallet to that wallet so that I can then show you the process of co-signing using the hardware wallet. So, um, okay, we go into receive, generate a new address. I can copy this address here and then send here, pay to paste max uh, and then pay. So. Okay, so transaction has been sent. Uh, now the transaction will appear here. So we get to simulate a transaction sending it back to the other wallet. So if I go here and I go in the receiving tab, generate a new address, that is where I would wanna send uh, testnet BTC. So in the context of Electrum here, um, that's interesting. I've never seen this logo here. What is this actually? Huh, okay, interesting. Um, why, what is this here? Hmm, I'll look into this a bit later. Uh, um, so yeah, um, oh yeah, so what's happening here, it's interesting. I actually have my own full node uh, for Bitcoin and Bitcoin testnet. I also have my own full node for Monero, um, experimenting with stuff and I've never seen this icon there because usually I only connect to one server and I just noticed that in the context of this setup, I am not connecting to only one server, I'm connecting to public node, hence why we're doing this over Tor. Okay, so uh, I am now in multisig and uh, let's, let's do this. Um, so uh, if I go to send and I copy this address and paste it in here and select max, pay, uh, the fee for this transaction seem unusually high. Uh, yeah, it's a very small amount of BTC, I guess. What a, yeah, okay. I'm curious here, I'm wondering why. Okay, so I mean, it's warning us because this is a very small amount of testnet BTC and fees are actually quite high. By the way, uh, rate here is something that you could adjust based on ETA. So this here will probably takes 25 blocks this here five and this here will be a next block. So uh, Electrum actually uses, um, you know, data from the blockchain to evaluate how long a transaction would take to be uh, essentially confirmed or mined. <clears throat> so in the context of this here, I'll leave it at the default and I'll enter my password here. Um, okay, now, um, Confirm transaction output on your Trezor device. That is where the multi-sig setup and the hardware wallet, uh, or the yeah hardware wallet, comes into play. This is so much more secure than just using Electrum on Mac. The reason why is uh, it needs access to a private key that is on this device here, which means that an infosec exploit on a computer would not be able to compromise the holding. One needs you know access to the hardware wallet, and since this is multi-sig. It can be either of this or that, uh, meaning that it is resilient. Uh, and yeah, the hardware wallets can be stored in different locations. It's amazing. So, okay, confirm here. So we're looking at the, uh, we're sending blah, blah, blah to the address. So I can confirm here uh, that the address is the right one. I'll do this kind of quickly, but for larger transactions, uh, one would want to really double check this uh, in full detail. Confirm, it will tell us uh, what the block height will be and it is telling us how much the fees are. Uh, so all of this matches what I had here, so I can confirm, and this here is signing the transaction, and the payment has been sent. So this is how one sets up a multi-sig wallet on Electrum with Trezor devices. Uh, it is possible to set up uh, similar setups using cold cards, actually, uh, and I might do this in a future episode. Cold cards are a really great alternative to Trezor, um, which I might discuss in future episodes. So I hope that was insightful. Um, I'll see you soon. By the way, for anyone watching this that misses the other privacy content that I use to publish, uh, more of this is coming. This was episode eight of 10 in the Bitcoin series. So I will be back to regular programming shortly. Stay tuned.